Okay, so let's talk quick about the bread. You can start picking up, start picking up um, form, and start thinking about the vigilante parade today. It, registration and all, because it's got to be, a, it's always food to jump through, that's why. On the 21st of April, and I know the parade is on the same day as the exam, and so that should add an, add an incentive, right? So, if you participate on a float, even though I know we have the AP exam, I understand that, but if you participate, and we get enough people doing it in each class, we get enough floats, we got, you know, I will give extra credit. If you participate, the more extra credit. Now, I know you have the test. And the parade starts at 12, and the test technically does not get over until 12. That's what we call a tight timeline. But hopefully, you won't have to sit there during the parade when the parade is done. Or, sorry, did I say sit there in the parade? Yeah. Sit there in the test after you finish. Sit there in that room. Don't you love when Saturday says, and if you sit there while everyone else is finishing up the test? Hopefully, you won't have to do that. I'll talk to the counselors. Sometimes they make you. I'm sorry. I'm just kidding, but most people get done a little bit early, so you can get going if you want to jump on a, a float. And so I will give you some extra credit. We've been trying to encourage people to do it for the last couple of years. Last year, we kind of did one at the fairground, which turned out okay, all things considered, even though I think there's a little bit of a traffic jam. Yeah. Yeah, we were robbed last year. We got a whole new segment on us. Nice. They didn't give us the link. They gave it to a million airplanes, which is horrible. It's the worst highway robbery you've ever seen. I can tell somebody. Yeah, yeah. I've got a whole new segment. Oh, that's a new one you said. I don't think you deserved it. Who thought the boxy flow should have won? Nobody. No, boxy was all right. Here's the problem you guys have nobody kept their laptop. Yeah. You yeah. always got to keep the laptop. Right? That's simple. Yeah. No left up. Sham. I do remember. Yeah, we. I. I walked. I walked around. Oh, I let me let me jump again. Not that about that much. So, they have all this information up for the library. They have float ideas. Everything. It's, it's really in. They've done a great job up there. But the other thing, you know, the steps. Most of the steps are really basic common sense. Like get a group together, pick a topic. But there's certain things you have to do. You have to keep your role sheet in. That's your permission slips because Thursday before the parade is a work day, so it's a school day. You have to get a permission slip. Uh, there insurance because you need car insurance for the, you know, the or the truck insurance was pulling the floor, you know, all that kind of stuff. So there's certain things you have to do, and so all that information there, and they have all the rules and regulations. Hey, if you have a float down Main Street with little kids running around, there's got to be rules. Like, you know, you, you can't throw things at little kids. Can't do that. I can't chuck a kid down the No. And I, I'm for chucking shit. Uh, chucking <laughs> chucking children. That's what you're going to Tardy. Uh, tardy? Taffy. <laughs> but um, little kids start, like, chasing them into the road. Yeah. And things that people used to have, like, they would have, like, like they'd bring a gun. Well, some people talking like real rifle. You see why we can't have that. You know, so there's little rules you got you can't have. But and one more thing about I don't know how it was been 12 or so years ago, there were like 15 drum woman mind floats in a row. The same exact thing in a row. So we made it a rule only two of one topic per school, or because we don't want all the same float. And so what we do is, it's first come, first serve. And if you have an idea, that's great. But we have lots of great ideas. And it's on the registration packet there. Lots of great ideas. 
because it has to be related to Helena history. And so these are the different categories, American Indian, Historic Helena, and just look at Historic Helena. Like for example, we have you know, the construction of the Civic Center, the collapse of the Hauser Dam. Someone had a really good one of that about six years ago. And they had water kind of going back and forth. And then the little thing with the water burst, like right in front of the, uh, of the parrot. <laughs> water just went everywhere. <laughs> It was hilarious because I didn't get wet, but others did. The earthquake, um, the tennis club in 1980. Um, someone had a problem with the first speed pop. The Montana club. You know, all kinds of ideas. And then you start a category, pick an idea. And if you come up with your own, that's perfectly fine. It just has to be approved by one of the co-chairs of the firm. And they're very open. And I'll say this about the co chair they're three of arguably the most intelligent and coolest people in this building. One is like really cool, the other aren't bad. Just throwing that out there. I didn't know Miss Pierce was on it. Hmm? She's relatively cool, but but not as cool. Because she hasn't been here in long. We're old. That so obviously I'm one. Mr. Mahalish and Mr. Wallace. Yeah, you I know. That makes me wise. And don't forget, I've consumed more lead than you. <laughs> so unpredictable. So with that, if you come to us, we're very open, all kinds of different ideas. In fact, someone just asked me about one. They said, what about like uh, jazz and Helena? And I said, tied to one of the early clubs. That's a great idea. So he's going to do that. Literally just text me. His name's Josh. Huh? His name's Josh. No, we don't know. I forgot already. <laughs> so, I might be cool, but my memory is going fast. So with that, and all these different categories, if you enter this category, we pick a winner in each category. Well, we we have judges, and the winner, the winning flow, there's a prize, and it's actually a lot of money. And deserving people will get that prize. I could not. So, yeah. Is it like cash? Is it, um, First prize is cash. And you would be surprised how much money the community, especially local businesses, get. You would be surprised. I'm always surprised. And then also like a gift card and things like that. So people in the thing will get that. And it's just amazing how much will come out of this. I like famous people. This is one I'm surprised more people don't do. So like when Lindbergh came to Helena. Uh, maybe the great, the greatest actor who ever came out of Helena, Gary Cooper or Myrna Loy, the two greatest actors. Um, John Kennedy came here in 1960. Just a lot of great ideas. And there's also an overall prize winner. That's a big cash prize. It's like seven or eight dollars wow. in quarters. So if you do that, you know, there's the parrot. We got the state fund, the sawmill. If you have an idea, that go come and ask. I'll give you more examples of this, but I, I'm going to include all of these files, a link on my uh, on Teams, and lots of good lots of good things on it. Yeah, each category is a prize and then a grand prize. Pretty yeah. And like second and third place, there's a bunch of gift cards that people get. You know, various things. So it's it's a pretty good deal. And also just something to do. Yes, we'll give extra credit, but it, it could be a lot of fun. Yeah. Can you do it from Housing Life? Hmm? Can you do it? Yeah, you just have to make sure that um, you can do it on there. You have to get on their sheet, but you have to fill out a uh, yeah a sheet for um, you have to have an excuse. So get one for help, get one from here for that, but you can do it now. I think the max is twelve people oh. on the floor. Yeah, we've had a lot of people do that. And so something to think about, and then Thursday before the parade, so on the 5th, that is a work day. And so you have that whole day to work, so you, as long as you fill out that blue sheet, you're excused from school. So you don't have to go to any classes, except mine. You will come in on that day. You will come into my class. So I don't care if you're excused, you have to come into my first, third, or fourth period class. You are coming in. That's time for the test. I'll do a couple of announcements for you, and then I will give you a practice test that you have to do. And you're going to do it, you can sit in class, and you have it done in 50 minutes. So you have a quick come in. 
I know everyone else will be working, but trust your partner or whatever. Just click come in and then you leave. You don't have to check in the class, you just check in the group. And I will make it worth your while. So last year, the last time we did this, because the last couple of years have been weird, but like, for example, those came in first period, I got donuts. So I ate donuts where I lived at that. That's worth your while. You can watch me eat donuts. Fourth period, we got pizza. And so I ate pizza while you guys And if we do, um, oh, by the way, that's where pizza comes from. What country is a fly guy? Italy. Italy. The first pizza. Yeah. <laughs> Remember Italian, the Italian nationhood. And the first pizza in Naples, and I've been to the pizza place that had that. They claim to make the first pizza. Tomato sauce, mozzarella cheese, basil. You guys are getting artichoke and beef on paper. I like thin crust, so you're getting paper. I will we'll get pizza, but you got to come on and we'll three thirds. I know it's a pain, but I'll, but we really have to sit down. Want to make sure you do it. It's just something we got to do. All right. I will mention this again. I will give you links of some really good information about. But so think about it. Think about getting friends together and do the fall. Sound good? Everyone happy? We do another one. So last year the parade. And you had your boxing floor. I remember a few other ones. I thought it was a really good idea. I'm not going to lie to you. When they said, hey, let's, we can't do it downtown, um, not just when another wave of COVID was hitting in April, and so we just can't do it. We just didn't know. And so we did it in the fairground, and everyone's going to drive through the fairground. Like, this is a good idea. It worked out pretty well. And so I went early on, and the three of us were kind of big fish. We, we walked. Through. No, there, you, I remember walking through and it was, you know, the start where they let people drive through and I went, I went up and I started getting texts from other teachers and they're saying, you would not believe the traffic jam. And I heard the traffic jam <laughs> went from the fairground well past Lowe's. Was anybody in it? Hmm? You. Oh, I was like, yeah. The line went on forever. Anybody? And I, I felt bad. And then it started to rain. And I felt really bad. I didn't do anything, but I felt bad about it. But I remember thinking, oh, it's, it's not, it's relatively cool. This is nice. It might rain. We didn't plan. It was amazing how many cars came. There were. Yeah, there were hundreds of cars. It was kind of shocking, which was good. All right, so did we get to, we got to this, right? Yeah. Mussolini, Bonus Army, Prophet. Did we get to Father Coughlin? Yes. Yeah. Okay, here we go. Father Coughlin, the radio priest. And he was the enemy. Remember, these are enemies on the right, conservative enemies. And don't forget, when I say conservative and liberal here, I'm in context of the New Deal. And don't forget that Wall Street put you, they literally tried to overthrow the government. Oh, Glass-Steagall would regulate what? Banks. SEC would regulate what? Banks. SEC, Securities and Exchange Commission. Oh, SEC. SEC, yes. Yeah, Wall Street, yeah, Wall Street. Uh, stock market. What did they get off of to, to inflate the currency? Go set. Okay, so here's the radio priest, and at first he's pro Roosevelt because Roosevelt was attacking them, and because he's anti-bank. But then he started accusing Roosevelt of being a communist. Now, by no means was Roosevelt a communist, but that was a very common way to attack people who wanted government intervention. But the big thing was, and this goes back to a trope from the Middle Ages, and shows how incredibly racist this time was. It was really anti-Semitic. And that trope that Jews controlled the banking industry. This lie from medieval Europe that has gone on and on and on. And so here's Father Coughlin. And he had his own paper called Social Justice. And where he would attack. And pretty soon he started calling Roosevelt 
either Rosa Jew or Rosa um, Veld, which is kind of a, a Jewy surname, to attack him. And this is a cartoon from his uh, newspaper, Social Justice. A horrifically racist trope of a Jew that's supposed to represent bankers with Roosevelt in his pocket. And if people see this, and I've seen people show this very picture and say it's from what country? Nazi Germany. No, this is the United States. This was so intensely, the country was so intensely anti-Semitic. And we're kind of forgets that for himself. But he played on that and would be really popular, audience of millions until 1941, December 10th, 1941, when Germany declared war on the United States. But even then, he did not totally go away. And so with that, let's get to enemies from the left, who thought Roosevelt was not doing enough. And the most prominent enemy were the tiny communists and also socialists. There were a lot more socialists than full communists. But the communists, and their anger? Roosevelt saving capitalism. By regulating it, by trying to limit the inequalities, but keeping the main elements of capitalism, they saw him as an enemy. Uh, Carl, uh, what they call them, a bourgeoisie uh, a socialist. He's saving capitalism. Actually, Roosevelt took this as a badge of honor. The communists hate him. The fascists hate him. He must be doing something right. And then... Other issue was race. Socialists and communists were fighting to end Jim Crow laws and also to get the right to vote. As you can see from this, con why does this keep popping up? Stay. This is a uh, vote for vote communist. Um, William Foster ran for the communists in 1936. And it says equal rights for women. So they're pushing for equal rights. They also want equal rights um, for women, socialists and communists. And they said Roosevelt was not doing enough. It wasn't enough to end discrimination in jobs programs. They have to end Jim Crow and also have an anti-lynching law, which is pretty amazing. There has not been an anti-lynching law in the United States until two weeks ago. It's kind of mind boggling. President Biden signed the law. Conservatives, Southerners kept that from passing. And not all Southerners, but they were more. So. And then a lot of fellow travelers, these are people who toyed with communism and socialism. These were like famous actors and directors and writers and screenwriters and authors, etc. A lot of people toyed with socialism because they had an answer to the big problem of communism. And the reason I'm mentioning this are they, you know, they didn't become socialists, they toyed with it, maybe went to a couple meetings, Thought Roosevelt wasn't doing enough, but it never really became one. But after the war, remember World War I, there was a Red Scare? There'll be another one after World War II. And all of this is going to be brought up. And this is going to lead to one of the most bitter times in American history, where they'll call these people up in front of the house and make them give names of people at these meetings, betray others, or they would be blacklisted and never allowed to work again. And that happened in the 1950s. We dubbed that as McCarthyism, but it was another Red Scare. And a lot of very famous actors had that choice and directors and couldn't work. Some never worked again. Some actors gave names. One would become president, Ronald Reagan. He gave all these names. FDR used arguments from the left and the right he told more conservative Democrats, if you don't support my, pro my programs, here come the socialists and communists. Or he told more, um, more uh, Democrats who thought he wasn't doing enough. And he said, you got to support my liberal programs or the fascists are coming in. He used it both ways. I, my liberal programs, will be the balancing act between the two. And so he could use that for both. Another big push, and this shows an example of how Roosevelt would use this, would be from the left, Dr. Francis Townsend. And this goes totally against trickle-down economics. Conservative, if, you, if someone truly believes in conservative economics, they hate old age pensions. A $2,000 year old age pension. 
which by the way was more than twice the yearly the median salary of workers yeah this was way off and soon dr townsend's plan there's dr townsend on um the two different nbc's there was a blue and red network back then nbc east was blue nbc west was red nbc west would have, red would eventually become abc but these towns in act clubs formed all over to push for this pension and fdr now you notice i didn't put the r there because i was just so tired i couldn't i couldn't do the r i just I didn't have the strength but i didn't quit i kept working they pushed roosevelt so roosevelt could say hey you could tell people who didn't want the pension we got to get a pension a smaller social security pension or we might get this massive one that would dramatically increase taxes and we can't afford i should add townsend did not think there should be a two thousand dollar a year pension but that's what he pushed for he's negotiating if you're negotiating for something you don't come in with what you want what do you do yeah you ask for more and then bargain down because if you're going to go into hard negotiations and ask for what you want, you won't get what you want. Unless you have all the power, but then it won't be hard negotiation. So this is how we use it. I should add one more thing. Don't forget something. Retirement, that whole concept, that whole concept of retirement is new in human history. Before the Industrial Revolution, that did not exist. But with the wage system, and people now more and more reliant upon a wage. There's going to be a time where you're going to be too old to work. And then what? Most people are not able to save enough money to retire. Which is definitely what it is now. They will not save enough to retire. And so you people start getting old at this time. It isn't like, oh, I'm getting near the end. No, it's panic for most people it was destitution to retire and most people when not retire it's just you can't work anymore it's your choice is you go live with your kids nobody wants to be a burden on your kids and don't forget your children are working on a wage too so that takes away from them or what So they set up these old age homes. And these old age homes were like these little, they called them old folks homes. And they weren't like this nice little retirement community. No, there was these boxy, stale, cold dorms where they literally packed old people in. They feed them a little bit of gruel and then they just would die. They were hell holes and they were terrifying. Most of them have been torn down now, but they're still around big cities. You might find these big, ugly buildings that might not think of what the heck were these? It was an old folks home. So when people saw this, this is real fear. And something that um, we now don't have as much fear, which it's good that we people don't have this fear of retirement, at least as much as they used to. It's bad that people forgot that. If you forget why change happened, you might allow changes to allow it to go back. So. Huey Long was another push for the left. By no means is Huey Long a socialist. But what he was saying was, people aren't getting enough. Regular people aren't um, working for enough pay while all the money's flowing to these big bankers and financiers are getting rich. And he was from Louisiana. He was a governor and then senator from Louisiana. He ran Louisiana. And he went from being a powerful Louisiana politician to one of the most well-known Americans. He was dubbed the kingfisher, which is kind of like the lead fish or the top dog. There was a really, I think it's a horrendously racist radio show. One of the first, in fact, maybe the, hardly the first series show, series, I'm sorry, first series, and everything would copy this, including TV series. It was called Amos and Andy, and one of the main characters was the kingfish. So he called himself the kingfish. And he started these share our wealth clubs and a share our wealth plan where every man, not just a few rich few, can be a king. And what did it mean? Well, they're going to take money 
from the U.S. government and guarantee everybody, they called it a homestead, $5,000 payment to every family in the 2000 a year. This money would come from confiscation. They would cap all income at $1 million and also tax wealth away too. It's not going to happen. No income over a million dollars. And that money then would go to regular people. As he said, they've been stealing money from your hard work for too long. And he went on the radio, he's kind of folksy, charming. The charm can come in a lot of different ways. You could have charm, it's like Roosevelt's kind of patrician charm, or kind of folksy at home charm. Yeah. $2,000 a year. That should have been a dollar sign. And then the five thousand dollars, a lump sum payment of five thousand dollars, and then two thousand every year. And he started talking about running for president. He said Roosevelt's not doing enough, and by thirty-five, he's seriously talking about it. Seriously. And this is one of the great what ifs in history. In the middle of talk of him running for president, he was assassinated. A doctor by the name of Carl Peavy assassinated him on the front steps of his ugly um, the capital that Huey Long just had built in Baton Rouge. He, uh, Peavy was a son-in-law of a judge that he thought um, the judge um, thought he was going to be on the state Supreme Court. He was mad. So it had nothing to do with Cheryl Long. But he assassinated him. If Long would have jumped into the presidential race, it's arguable, arguable that we'd have an entirely different course of history. Because he wouldn't have ran as a Democrat. He would have ran as a third-party candidate. And remember what I told you. We have winner-take-all in this country, and that's why we are stuck with two political parties. Because if Huey Long would have jumped into the race as, let's say, the share our wealth party, who just went, would have made it up for that one, one election, who would he have taken votes from? What candidate? The Democrat was Roosevelt, and the Republican in 36 was the governor of Kansas, Outland. From whom? He actually thought Roosevelt, Landon was more conservative. He wanted more. So we would have taken votes from him. We would have taken votes from Roosevelt. Maybe several lines, but most from Roosevelt. So he would have divided that vote that would have went to Roosevelt, who's going to be president. The Kansas guy, Alf Landon. Can you imagine how history would be different? I can't even imagine. And that's anything is Landon, but we know what Roosevelt did, and especially when World War II is coming, what Roosevelt did there. It's kind of scary. Who knows what would have happened? But he was assassinated. Now, Roosevelt would use this down the road. Uh, we're not gonna, there's, like the, the very artsy picture I took. Is that exciting? That's the very ugly capital in Louisiana that that's the statue of Huey Long. It doesn't look like he's emerging from a rock. But I um, that's a picture of the capital in Baton Rouge. And it is ugly. It was shot right in the step. I know it doesn't look that bad until you start getting close and it just mm. now the ugliest capital, two capitals, South Dakota and Nebraska. Nebraska looks like a, a department store, and South Dakota looks like a department store that they stuck a, a, a dome on. South Dakota's like cinder block, boxy thing. Oh, we should put a dome. So it's kind of fun. But this will all help push Roosevelt to the second New Deal. The New Deal wasn't doing enough, the second New Deal. Bigger programs, thus you see the more spending. This is one rabbit that would never fail me, him as a music. Uh, uh, I about, about said musician, magician. And this would be, in essence, the liberal agenda. Government spending, government interaction, direct government, um, creating jobs, creating uh, old age pension, but also protecting capitalism. And don't forget, when I talk liberal and conservative, especially in this context, I'm talking about here. So conservatives do not want these programs do not want antitrust laws. Liberals do. So when I talk about, when I want to mention yesterday, um, 
a couple of uh, presidents and uh, more modern presidents said they're conservative or liberal. I'm referring to in the context of this. So with that, here's the first biggie. Pushed by Dr. Townsend, the Social Security Act. And this would be an old age pension. Here's Roosevelt signing the bill right there. Now, populists and progressives have been pushing this. Conservative economics, trickle down, hates Social Security. Hates it. Not only because this could potentially tax the rate, even though this doesn't really do that, but it also can raise wages. So $15 a month is a lot less than 2000 a year. It's not that big, but it was signed. It was a guarantee. If you worked, you got a pension. So you would not be destitute. And for most retirees, for two thirds, Social Security is to this day their, their biggest source of retirement income. So this has changed everything. Social Security have to work. It is tied to work. It's what we call social insurance. In the water. <laughs> social insurance is this. People who aren't retired pay for the people who are. Meaning, I am working now, and part of my paycheck goes to retirees. When you work, you will pay for my retirement. So you better get two or three jobs because I expect a very high <laughs> That's fair, right? But you have to work. You have to be invested in. And it's relatively easy to be invested. If you're working now and get a W-2, you're already becoming invested, invested in the system. I know it's really weird to think about because most of you probably are at least a couple years away from retirement, right? You got a couple years. It is so funny when we were all like, you're going to be, you're going to be like this. I was like this. It's like, oh, that's such a long way. And all said, it's really not that far. Boy, let's learn more about Social Security. But back to this. It's just like any insurance. We all have to get liability insurance, at least if you have a car. You pay even if you're not in a car wreck. But then if there is a wreck or you're liable, that comes out of that pool. Same thing. It's insurance. Or health insurance. Part of my pay is health insurance. That money goes to health insurance. I'm not sick now, but that will pay for people who do get sick or if I do get sick, which I'm not planning on getting sick, so that won't happen. And it also had unemployment insurance. And so if you're laid off, you get at least a little bit of your paycheck, about 30 to 40 percent of your previous pay. And this is to help people get through the time of being laid off when they lose your job. But the big thing is this would also there's mass layoffs. There won't be a big crash in demand. Trust me. I've actually never really been laid off, but I know people who have. I've been kind of lucky. But it's pretty scary that Social Security is a break. I know people have, and it's really a big deal. It's all paid for with a payroll tax. So it comes out of your check every month. And this comes out of your gross salary. It is taxed. The, I'll talk about the cap in just one second. It was originally 1%, today it's 6.2 matched by your employer. So in reality, it's 12.4% tax. 6.2% you pay, your employee matches. If you're self-employed, you gotta pay the full 12.4%. For most Americans, this is their biggest tax they pay. This is the biggest tax. It's bigger than income tax for most Americans. Because it's on gross and you all pay it. If you, anybody ever looked at their pay stuff and saw like FICA, I got that's so scary. That's so scary. Now, income tax is different. That's one of the different taxes. Income tax, you can get back if you don't meet the deduction. Now, the cap um, benefits as you go up, if, if your lifetime income um, is high or low, your benefits are relatively low, and it kind of goes up a little bit as your income goes up. And then it's capped at a certain point, and so are the taxes. Originally, it's four thousand dollars. Now I think it's one hundred twenty-four, one hundred twenty. I got to look it up again because there's been inflation, so that's changing. But um, approximately one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars a year is the cap, meaning you only pay taxes on your first one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars. 
all income above $125,000, you don't pay this tax and your employee doesn't match. And so if you make $70,000 a year, 6.2, well, 12.4% comes out of that. If you make a million dollars a year, you only pay the 6.2% tax on that first $124,000. The next one, um, $876,000, you pay no tax. Now, that means a lot of wealth is not being taxed. And this will become a problem down the road. I'll explain it in just a second. But what do we call this tax? Because clearly, rich people are paying a lower percentage of their income for this tax. Is this a progressive tax or a regressive tax? Say it again. Regressive. Yeah, this is regressive. So everybody write down this is regressive. The higher your income, the lower your tax. Roosevelt felt he had to do this because he had to get conservative Southern Democrats and Northern conservative Democrats. Because they were mostly opposed. And this will be a problem down the road. But this poster, and they really advertise this, is part of the reason why this bill would be such a big deal. There were so many, especially this time, widows or single mothers. This would provide benefits for widows, which talk about total destitution. And then dependent children. Dependent children is a key factor in this. If the unfortunate situation where one of your parents, uh, one, one of two parents passes away, the children will get Social Security benefits until they're adults. And I, a, a good friend of mine, that happened to his father. Hey, yeah, it was off, but this was a life. This was a, a lifesaver. So straight survivor. Such. I mean, just it was a lifesaver. You they didn't have much before, and I, I can remember this. Even you know the little bit you know when you're a kid, but I can still vividly remember that. And he's Kyle's doing well, so it worked out well. And. Any extra money they get from this valley, they bury it here in special locations, and you get a map when you retire. And that's where you get to pick up. Okay. The surplus, because they actually um, almost always collect more than they actually pay out, it goes into what's called a trust fund. And this trust fund that they can use when they don't collect them out of taxes to pay for the retirees. Now, the trust fund, it's not like they keep all the money in a jar. They invest the money and they invest the money in the most secure investment of the world. The most secure investment of the world. And it's also very ironic because the Social Security Administration, Social Security Administration, which is part of the US government, buys what? The surplus. US government treasury bills. US government, yeah. The most secure, it is the most secure uh, investment in the world. Are U.S. government bonds. Stocks are not good investments compared to bonds. Stocks can be bad. Crypto's a really good investment. But if I got some for you, well, um, the problem with this is, is that actually it can be a good thing. Not really the problem. The weird thing is, almost 30% of all the U.S. debt. They talk about how much debt the U.S. government has. It's owned by the U.S. government. The U.S. government loaned money to itself. It's such a weird thing. That could be good, though, because it's easy to pay back yourself. You just kind of go, what? Payback. <laughs> well, so they really advertise this. Convincing people, log in, about to really start getting deferred social security numbers, um, a monthly check. Now, a couple things. This is the definition of liberal program, except the taxes. This is liberal. And conservatives hate this. If somebody truly believes in trickle-down trickle -down economics, and conservative economics to this day, they hate Social Security. But it is by far the most popular thing in the United States government. Because every retiree, especially when they start getting closer, they start thinking about it. And most people, this secures them at least some form, form of dignity when they are retired. And then it'll become a burden on their family or others. Not 100%, but it does. 
And another thing, it is not going to work. If anybody says Social Security is going broke, you can count on one of two things. Number one, they're lying to you. And they're trying to get something. They're trying to convince you to get rid of Social Security. That's because they probably don't like it. Now, you can not like it either, but they're not telling you the truth. Or they don't know. And either way, be very afraid of them. Protect your wallet. That's my goal. If anybody says this. Uh, but what's the problem? With that cap, when they pass the, the tax up to 6.2%, they never dreamed that our society would be so unequal today. That the richest 1% would have over 40% of the income. And that means they're not paying much tax. And so what's happening? They're not collecting as much money as they thought. What is the generation we call the big bubble generation after World War II? They're all retired. What do we call it? Yeah, that's where the whole generation garbage came. <laughs> was because of the baby boomers. They have generation X and Z and W. Millennials and all that garbage. But what happened? They're not paying enough. And so they're, they might not be able to make their better payments. In the next 10 or 15 years, they might become benefits. It's not going broke. As long as people work, it'll still be there. And so this is going to be a big deal. In 2005, uh, George W. Bush was reelected and then talked about putting all of Social Security into the into Wall Street. And yeah, the crash was coming, by the way. And people just went nuts and he lost a lot of popularity, ironically, after he was elected. And so no politician likes to talk about that. So let's get to the Wagner Act. The Wagner Act, another incredibly important bill. It's also called the National Labor Relations Act. And this would allow for labor unions. Labor unions. Companies must recognize unions if one over 50% of the members vote for a union. I know, isn't that majority? I'm just telling you the way they wrote the law. It's one over 50% at least. And so they must have an election. Um, some of these elections can get really bitter. Amazon is going to spend some $24 million in one month to keep out the union in New York City. That's how desperate they were to keep the union out. By the way, the union won last week. So Amazon might have to pay higher wages and get their workers bathroom breaks. I agree with you. Workers should not have bathroom breaks. Carry around a plastic bottle. Yes, that's what happened to Amazon workers. Remember that next time you order from Amazon. But I do remember it. And I do feel guilty, <laughs> but I do still occasionally with Amazon because that's kind of the place you can get stuff. I know it's not a bad. And therefore, their unions can collectively bargain for the work. So they come up with a contract. Most of the work you think are like worker safety and things like that, like bathroom breaks or uh, benefits like vacation or that kind of thing, but also wages. Now, companies, of course, hated this. And then it set up the National Labor Relations Board appointed by the president. To uh, do the elections, and if workers are mistreated because they try to form a union, they can make a petition to the NLRB. But that's really hard to do. And this has the problem of all regulatory bodies. If the president is pro labor, they'll be really active. If the president is anti labor, they'll do nothing. And so these boards always are iffy. So, like in your lifetime, there hasn't been a real pro-labor one, but there's been one intensely anti-labor union president when you were born, President Bush. President Obama was kind of lukewarm. President Trump, even more intensely anti-union and anti-worker. And then President Biden is a little bit more pro-worker than Obama. We haven't had a real pro-labor NLRB since uh, Lyndon Johnson. And so that's where we're at now. So this, you know, it, it really depends. But why did Roosevelt want this? Roosevelt's thought is very simple. Unions raise wages and we have to get money into people's hands. Don't forget there's always this bargain. Companies need to make money to survive. So wages take money away from their revenues and profit. I understand that workers, and we all understand that workers need money to survive and buy goods and promote the economy. We all understand that. It's a balancing act. So it really depends on individual situations and where you are. Most people are workers and they don't own. But anyways, wages. This will stimulate demand. 
And the other thing is, if Roosevelt is known for um, pushing unions, as this 1936 poster from the CIO labor union says, what party will labor union members vote for? This is really good politics. I will provide you with better wages, remember me. And up until the 1970s, labor unions were a massive democratic bloc. Then the whole thing began to blow up in the, about the Vietnam War, civil rights, and then the weird economy of the 1970s. And then I would argue also the growth of country music, but that's another story. Have you listened to country music? I'm sorry, people. And also uh, certain forms of disco. I blame that for a lot of bad things too. Not all disco, but some. Same with the country, not all country, but 70s country. I like Dolly Parton, but she's pretty cool. Right, moving on. Now, how do conservatives feel about this law? Oh, we jump, we'll jump right here. I'm gonna put this down. Conservatives hated this. By 1950, 36% of all workers were in the labor union. Wages began to go up. By the way, that's where we got the 40 hour work weekend and weekends because of labor unions. And vacation time and healthcare, the weird healthcare system, good and bad. But since the 1980s, unions have tanked. Conservative econ economics began to become more powerful and union membership began to drop. So in the 1960s, union membership was in the mid 30%. By the 1970s, it began to drop. When I was in high school, it was about 25%. And today, about five. And the corresponding drop in wages, without a doubt. And also, <laughs> Democrats have been brought to the anti union too. This is part of conservative economics. One more thing I'll show you. Here's the income of the top 1%. Here's during the 20s, the beginning to drop of the New Deal. Here's labor membership. When labor union membership dropped, wealth of the top 1% went up. Wages are directly tied to the richest 1%. And that's good or bad. Remember, if you believe in conservative economics, they'll use that to invest. But they are tied. And then everybody, tomorrow, don't let me forget, we start with the wealth tax act. By the way, you notice something? I'm really trying hard to tie everything to this. You notice that? I'm really trying to tie that to how this directly affects you today. All of it does. And if you don't believe me, ask your grandparents about Social Security. I'm kidding. Right. Um, yeah, I need to get math. Tomorrow you get talk about the law. You're right. I'm just going to take it forward to you. Yeah. That's the year. How long did you have to do that? Do 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 <laughs> Easy to do. Yeah. No, wait, I got, I got to do that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I just noticed that you got I want a room to fit in. Thursday and Friday before, and then these past couple days oh, I went to Hosa. Yeah. Where did you go for the break? Hawaii. How was Hawaii? It was really nice. Oh, it's people like you. <laughs> That's my wife and I thought about it, and then we didn't go into Southern California. Oh, nice. We went to Bio City, then Southern California. I love Southern California. You know, this, it would just be something. And also not be cold. Even though, listen, just once I thought it was going to be. Really? What island were you on? Uh, we were on Maui. I heard Maui is pretty cool. It's really nice. It's really like, like. Yeah, because Oahu, there's so many more people. My wife really wanted to go to Kauai. Same kind of thing. It's more laid back. 
She's been there. I have. That's my brother. Chicken or fish? Uh, I think chicken. Uh. And I did post all the notes and everything. Oh. So, I, oh, that reminds me, I have blue sheets. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. Oh, we had the industrial revolution. Oh! Day the universe changed. Bonus. Oh, you really want a bonus? Yes. All right, I'll give you a bonus. Oh, it'll be the same bonus I asked the other clowns. What? What president died? Wrong, but Which one? The tax. I feel like it's really not right at all. Harding. Never would have gotten that. Harding does have Harding done. Now, Cooch. Good to know. We did it. We talked about it in class. We did? Yes. When? Third period? That's one thing about a class like this, we cover so many things, mm -hmm. it can be easy to miss a few. Oh, good. And did you like the one to the left bottom? 
Yeah, it was good. It was interesting. All right, good. Thank you. Yeah, the bonus army is a really big deal. See you tomorrow.